go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Apologies for the late start, and thank you to the tech guys for sorting out the power problems up here. Uh, so thanks for coming along to this session. We're going to be talking about Swift object encryption. Uh, my name is Alistair Coles. I'm with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I'm also a core reviewer on the Swift project. I'm Janie Richling. I work for IBM Cloud. I've been working on Swift development for a little over a year. Okay, I start my stopwatch. So there's um, there's plenty of really good talks on Swift at uh, this week's summit. Some of those talks uh, will be describing to you the features of Swift, what you can do with it. Some of them are from operators that are telling you about uh, their experiences of using Swift. In this session, we're going to be taking a little bit of a look into the future and telling you about some work that's going on in the upstream Swift developer community uh, to bring you a new feature in the future, uh, which is the ability to encrypt Swift object data that's at rest uh, in backend storage. So I should just be very clear about that at the start. Uh, what we're talking about is work that's still in development. It's not yet been released as a feature for Swift. But that said, we are working really hard on it and hope to bring it to you soon. Also, I want to acknowledge up front that uh, although Janie and I are the lucky ones to come here and speak to you this morning, the work we're describing is a team effort. And so right up front, we want to thank the other contributors from the Swift developer community uh, to this work. You can see them there hard at work at one of our recent mid-cycle meetups. OK, so I'm going to give you a very brief uh, high-level overview of Swift before we get into some of the more uh, detailed discussion of how we're encrypting data at rest. Swift is an object store. Uh, it has a REST API. It's accessed via HTTP. It offers the usual CRUD operations, that is, you can create, read, update, and delete your objects in Swift through that REST API. Swift is not a file system. It's not a hierarchical file system. It has a very shallow naming hierarchy. Objects are grouped into containers. Containers belong to accounts. And in the context of an open stack environment, those accounts have a one-to-one -one mapping to Keystone tenants. And Swift is perfect for storing blobs of unstructured data. So maybe it's a virtual machine image, photographs, media clips, whatever it might be. Swift's great for storing that stuff. There's a number of clients available for Swift, um, both command line and uh, libraries, bindings to various languages. Just showing you here how you'd use a very simple curl command to make a put request to create an object in Swift and use get to retrieve that object. If we look behind the scenes, Swift has been designed to be highly scalable. Uh, the evidence for that, uh, there was talk yesterday uh, in the summit, and in previous summits we've had talks from operators who've described how they've successfully scaled their production Swift clusters to capacities of many tens of petabytes, uh, storing billions of objects. How does Swift achieve that scalability? Well, there's many contributing factors. But one of them is the way in which it does a great job of distributing load throughout the Swift cluster. So when an object is put into Swift, uh, it's first handled by a proxy server at the front end. And one of the roles of that proxy server is to decide where that object will be located in a larger pool of storage nodes in the back end. And the proxy server does this using a mechanism known as consistent hashing slightly modified form of consistent hashing. And much as I'd love to go into detail of describing to you how that works, um, really all I have time for is to tell you that the, the outcome is that objects are distributed uniformly across that pool of back-end storage nodes, which means that load is distributed uniformly across the pool of storage nodes. Another property of consistent hashing is that it's deterministic. That means that any proxy server can independently determine the location of an object in the pool of back-end storage nodes. So that means that we can also very easily spread load across the front-end proxy servers. Uh, there's very little need for them to communicate or share state with each other. So that's one of the ways in which Swift has been designed to scale. Um, one consequence of that is that any particular storage node, in fact, any disk, 
in a storage node is highly likely to be storing objects that belong to more than one tenant of the Swift cluster. Now, the significance of that, and why I've drawn that out now, I will come back and explain later in the context of encryption. Swift is also a highly durable storage service. So, in fact, when that object is put into the Swift cluster and arrives at the proxy server, the proxy server actually uh, spreads the content across multiple backend storage nodes. And it does this with a configurable redundancy factor. So this is achieved either by using erasure coding or just straightforward replication of the object content. And on my slide here, I've, I've kind of illustrated a very typical replication policy where three copies of the object are stored on three storage nodes uh, for durability. The choice between erasure coding or replication depends upon the application. But whichever, whichever it is, the outcome is that Swift is able to continue to serve object data back to serve GET requests, even in the face of node failures or network partitions. So your data is very durable in Swift. What about security, though? Is Swift secure? Obviously, we're here this morning to tell you about some work we're doing to make Swift more secure. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that Swift, as it stands today, is not an insecure service. I think many of you will be familiar with the Keystone Identity Service. Swift uses that to authenticate every request that's received at the API. And then Swift has um, authorization middleware uh, that will either grant or deny access to resources for those requests. Also, it's a feature of the Swift architecture that only those front-end proxy servers are exposed to externally facing networks. The larger pool of storage nodes in the back end are isolated from those external uh, networks. So those are measures that are taken to prevent uh, the unintentional leaking of data out of Swift through its API, and they do a great job at that. But there are other ways in which data might leak from our Swift clusters. And the one that we're specifically focused on in the work that we're doing is the risk that a third party gains physical access to a disk from one of the backend storage nodes. So in other words, how do we protect ourselves from this guy? Uh, this is uh, Fonzie. He, I believe he's a friend of Janie's. Um, and you can see here that Fonzie is making his way out of a data center with a truckload of disks. Now, it could be that Fonzie is a trusted, authorized uh, member of staff that is in the process of disposing of disks that have been retired from a Swift cluster. If that's the case, then we hope that those disks are going to be thoroughly scrubbed, if not destroyed, before they leave a secure physical environment. So now, yeah, this, the story actually of how I obtain these disks uh, just demonstrates the need for encryption. Um, went to a com computer store that shall remain nameless and uh, <laughs> smiled real pretty and said I needed some disks for an art project and left the store with a basket full of somebody's used hard drives. All right. And I read an estimate recently, in fact, um, the estimate is now several years out of date, so I'm sure it's a very conservative number, that each day, something in the order of 50,000 drives are retired from data centers globally. And the process of ensuring that those drives are scrubbed is not straightforward and may not be particularly quick. So, you know, there is a risk that these disks find their way out of a data center with our users' objects stored on them at rest in the clear. Of course, it could be that Fonzie is a malicious intruder and that actually he's in the process of stealing these disks. And if that's the case, then we have even more reason to be concerned about the destination of the data on them. So what we're seeking to do uh, in Swift is to add the ability to ensure that all of the content of our users' objects is encrypted while it's at rest on those disks. And then, assuming that we uh, do a good job of keeping the encryption key separate and secure, we have a lot more confidence that should one of these disks find its way out of the data center unclean, that in fact our user data is effectively 
inaccessible to third parties. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Janie, and she's going to talk in more detail about how we're building that into Swift. But first, uh, we'll just look at a couple of existing mechanisms that people actually use to achieve um, at-rest encryption. <coughs> so the first might be to use some kind of hardware encryption technique. This could be self-encrypting drives, or it could be that you have a disk controller that has encryption capabilities uh, built into it. And presumably this is going to give you great performance. The encryption algorithms are implemented in hardware. And also it means that everything that is written to those disks will be encrypted. So not just the content of Swift objects, but actually uh, all of Swift's metadata, and in fact the metadata of the file systems that Swift is writing its objects into, everything will be encrypted as it's written to those disks. But each of those disks will have a single encryption key that is used to encrypt all of that content. So this means that, let's say, for example, we wanted to have separate keys for separate tenants that are used in our cluster. Well, that's not something that we can do using just this kind of hardware encryption approach. Uh, the key that's used to encrypt is shared across all of the tenants' data. And this is why I pointed out to you earlier the fact that some of these drives and all of these drives are likely to be storing objects that belong to multiple tenants. And why might we like more flexibility? Well, let's say you actually wanted to render a tenant's data effectively inaccessible, or effectively erase a tenant's data by erasing their encryption key, but not erasing any other tenant's data. Well, that's not something that we can achieve with this kind of approach. Or it might be uh, that you want to use um, what's known as a bring-your-own-key model, where the user actually provides Swift with the key that's used to encrypt and decrypt their data. Well, again, that's not something that we can support using this kind of hardware encryption approach. Moving away from a hardware solution, um, we could use a software encryption solution. Uh, so, for example, we could use technology such as DMCrypt and build ourselves some encrypted virtual block devices. Again, this is going to have the same features and the same uh, inflexibility, if you like, with key management as I described for the hardware solution. Also, just a reminder, I told you how Swift stores multiple copies of objects on multiple storage nodes. So with a software encryption solution that's implemented on those storage nodes, we end up encrypting the same data, in this case three times in three different places which is not particularly efficient, and these nodes are often not optimized for that kind of CPU-intensive workload. So, what we've been building in Swift is a software encryption solution in Swift itself that gives us much greater flexibility over the management of keys, including supporting those bring-your-own-key use cases I mentioned, and also only encrypts the data once as it passes into Swift and once decrypts it once as it passes out of Swift. So Jane is going to come and go into some more detail about that now. All right. So yeah, what we've been working on is encryption and decryption middleware that will live in the proxy. And so that means that only one copy of the data is going to be encrypted as it passes through the proxy server before it gets distributed to the storage nodes. So one thing is the proxy holds the auth authentication middleware, so it already has access to the user's identity and credentials, and those can be used to be passed to a key manager service like Barbican. And another thing this desi design provides is it allows to support user-provided keys uh, that would be included into the request as headers. And um, so this was the BYOK that uh, Alistair mentioned a minute ago. And notice with this design, you can upgrade to encrypt new objects without changing your hardware or uh, backend virtual disk provisioning. And so a side effect of doing it this way is that your data is encrypted uh, during the ingress into the Swift cluster. So the data between the proxy server and the storage nodes will be encrypted in flight. Uh, notice that the in-flight encryption is not one of our primary goals, but it's definitely worth noting as a benefit. So 
to enable encryption, you want to add uh, three pieces of middleware. Uh, for those of you familiar with Ghostbusters, we named one of ours after the key, ma key master of Gozer. Uh, <laughs> we have another middleware piece called the Gatekeeper, and we use a gating system called Zool, so definitely seemed fitting. Um, the role of the key master is to, of course, provide keys to the encryptor and decryptor middleware. So it does this via a callback method. And another role is it decides when uh, it's necessary to encrypt or decrypt an object. So if it decides that it's not necessary, then uh, it sets a, an override in the environment. For our first version of encryption, the key master is probably going to remain pretty simple. Uh, there's a root secret for the cluster, and it's provided to the key master. And from that, it derives separate keys for each container and each different object. Um, note that the keys aren't put in the request environment, and they're never cached or persisted in the system. So under this model, uh, the key derivation, you see this sort of hierarchy. Uh, the inputs to the derivation algorithm uh, are the cluster root secret and the unique path to the container or account. Um, we're using HMAC, which will uh, create a hash that's a SHA-256 and it makes use of the root secret to then uh, achieve a, an appropriate level of security that we need for this. So as we mentioned, we're going to support the BYOK. Uh, this is the push model where the user supplies the re uh, necessary keys on the request. And just want to reiterate that those keys are not cached or persisted. Uh, and this has a lot of greater interest or interest in the greater community. Uh, there's several talks this summit uh, for this topic. Yesterday, uh, Nathan Reller gave a great talk on bring your own keys. Uh, today, the security team has a fishbowl, and tomorrow, Barbican has a fishbowl. So those would be great to attend if you're interested. Um, so this is the poll model. Uh, the only difference is, instead of the user providing the keys on the request, uh, the key master can call out to a key manager, uh, such as Barbican, in order to get the keys. And so the, the client can uh, be managing their own keys in that key manager. So let's move away from key derivation or you know, key management for a little while and just talk about the encryption itself. So on the left, you see uh, a few values from the request as it is in plain text. And then on the right side, you have the corresponding values as they will be at rest. So we have the E tag, which in Swift is the MD5 hash of the object contents. So that will be encrypted and encoded, as well as um, all of the user metadata on an object is encrypted and encoded. So in this example, we have bank account password. That string will be encrypted. And of course, the object body. And you see here the length of the body remains the same. Um, that's an actual uh, special property of the cipher mode that we're using. So we chose to use uh, AES encryption with 256-bit keys. Um, this is uh, an industry standard widely accepted to be secure, uh, despite the fact that the NSA agrees with that. <laughs> uh, and AES, just like any other block uh, cipher, has to be adapted to be able to um, work on an object size larger than a block. So in order to do that, we use CTR mode. And so there's several different ways to adapt uh, an encryption algorithm um, to, to stream data. So uh, in Swift, we have a specific requirement to be able to uh, decrypt a, an arbitrary subrange of the object. And that's because we have a feature called a ranged get. And so the user can uh, request, to have, um, request to have a subrange of bytes from the object. Um, actually, they can supply a, a request for multiple ranges. And CTR mode allows for efficient, uh, efficiently decrypting those. So this is a picture of CTR mode. I wish we had time to get into it, but I uh, really just want to say uh, the important part is the plain text is only XORed with the key stream, so that what happens is the ciphertext ends up being positionally equivalent to the plain text, and that allows for the efficient ranged gets. 
And now we're going to watch a demo of how to encrypt your Swift data. OK, thanks, Jenny. How are we doing with time? We're, just, uh, we're good. Just get myself over here. OK, so for this demonstration, um, I am using a mini Swift cluster that is running uh, entirely in a single virtual machine on my laptop. Um, one of the advantages, one of the reasons I'm doing that uh, is it means that uh, all of my services, in particular my storage node services, are writing their data into directories on that virtual machine's file system. So it's really easy for me to show you where the data is at rest. And we can go and kind of dig around in that back end and have a look at stuff. So uh, yeah, so all of the uh, essential services are running in this virtual machine, including um, a little pool of backend storage node services. Uh, the code I'm running, uh, all, all the work we're doing, is um, is being developed on uh, an upstream feature branch. Uh, so the code I'm running is, is from there. And as Janie mentions, we um, we've worked really hard to not break any of Swift's API, uh, so this code passes all of our Swift functional test suite. OK, so the first thing I need to do is um, get myself uh, a token that I can use throughout this demo to authenticate all of the requests that I make to the Swift API. Um, and I'm just going to kind of label that point. So every, every request I make to the API is authenticated. Therefore, I expect, and it's perfectly OK, for me to be seeing my data in the clear, to be seeing plain text come back through the API, because I have authenticated myself. Unlike when I go and look at the file system and start opening up files. So I have a token, and I need to create a container first into which I'm going to put an object. And uh, so I just use a curl command. And again, throughout the demo, I'll just be using curl to make put and get requests to the Swift API. I pass in that token as a header and uh, have the storage URL there appended with slash C. C is the name of my container. And that worked, so I start to relax. Good. So I'm going to show you three scenarios. Um, in the first scenario, I'm actually going to override our encryption middleware, disable encryption, and just show you plain text being stored at rest in the back end. The second scenario, we're then going to use the, uh, the encryption middleware that's installed in this mini Swift cluster and uh, use the service managed key model. So Swift will be applying the encryption keys to the data that I pass in. And in the third scenario, I'm going to show you how we can do bring your own key, where the user, the, the request, will actually be supplying the keys to Swift. So first of all, I want to disable the encryption. So we've, we've just put a, like a little um, feature in here where we can override our encryption middleware by adding this uh, header, x crypto override, set its value to true. And that just informs the encryption middleware to ignore this request and pass data on through without taking any action. And I'm going to put an object in. I'm going to be reading um, the object content out of um, a file, secret.tuxt. So that's going to go into Swift. The object gets created. And as a sanity check, I can do a get request to the API and get my object back and have a look at the content. And there you go. There's my secret. I love Swift. So now let's go and look at what's happened uh, on disk. So as I said, I'm running a pool of storage nodes. I've actually chosen to use a triple replication uh, redundancy policy. So I'm going to have three storage nodes that are each storing a copy of that object in the file system. There you go. Uh, at the leaf of each of those directory paths is a file with a dot data extension. That's where my object is stored, three copies of it. Um, the file name is actually a timestamp, seconds since the Unix epoch. Um, so 
the more observant of you will realize that I'm actually running a scripted demo here, but it is live. And if you don't believe me, you take that timestamp, run it through a date command, and it's about 30 seconds ago, or however long it took me to uh, say that, in UTC. So let's just select, find one of those um, data files in the back end. There's the path to it. And take a look inside. And sure enough, there's my object data in the clear. That's what I get if I manage to steal this laptop, get this disk, walk out of the data center. I could just look in that file and find it. Now, I mentioned at the start that Swift uh, organizes or groups objects into containers. Uh, so we can do a get on the container URL, and it's going to return us a list of all of the objects in that container. Um, but that list for each object also has some metadata about the object. So let's do that and see what we get. There's only one object in this container. So there we see a little dictionary um, that has some metadata. It has the size and bytes of the object when it was last modified. Um, but it also has this field, uh, the hash. Um, so Somewhat confusingly, this is what is also referred to as the E tag, the entity tag. This is the MD5 sum hash of my object content. So once we start encrypting uh, our object, this particular piece of metadata is something that we would also like to have encrypted. We don't really want to be revealing the hash of the plain text of our objects. And this is also stored uh, in the back end. So again, if I filter now for the container part of those storage node directories, um, at the leaf of each one, there's a database that's holding that list of objects. Uh, again, it's triple replicated, so you see three copies of it. And if we go and look inside that uh, container database, so I'll just find one, one of those paths and uh, run uh, an SQL select query on that database. Sure enough, there's the metadata for that object. So this means that as well as encrypting the object data file that I first showed you, we also need to encrypt at least some of the metadata that finds its way into the container database. OK, so now I'm going to actually enable the encryption middleware in this cluster. So I going back to the beginning of the sequence of curl commands. I'm going to put my secret object in once more using a put request. This time, I'm simply omitting the X crypto override header. So I'm going to be using the default mode of the cluster, which is to encrypt my object. That succeeds. And now we're going to find the object file uh, in the back end. Uh, and there's one of the data files. You'll see that file name, that timestamp has advanced because I've just put a new version of the object into the cluster. So that's now the current time. And if we look inside this file, phew, that's ciphertext. OK, so my object's now been encrypted. If I do a get to the API, as I emphasized at the start, my, my requests to the API are, auth are authenticated. I expect to get back uh, the uh, plain text. So sure enough, I do I get my plain text back through the API because the middleware is decrypting this object on its way back out of Swift. And just to check, if I do a get to the container URL to get that listing with the metadata of the object, because that's an authenticated request, the container metadata has been decrypted. And I see that object hash, that entity tag, the MD5 sum, unchanged, still in the clear there. However, if I now go and inspect the content of the container database that's at rest and run that SQL query again, you see that what we've put into the database is also an encrypted version of the object entity tag here. Uh, there's also a bunch of um, metadata there that just informs the decryptor to do the right thing as the object comes out. But this is the, uh, this is the ciphertext of the MD5 hash of our object. OK, so that was showing you an object being put and uh, retrieved from the cluster using the, uh, the inbuilt encryption mechanism and uh, cluster managed keys. I'm now going to show you the third scenario where I uh, use a bring your own key model. So to do this, I need to generate myself some keys. They're just 32 byte string uh, sequences, 
Um, I need to base64 encode it so I can send it as an HTTP header. I have an object key, and I make myself a container key. And then I construct the same curl put command to put my secret in, but this time I'm adding two headers to pass in those two keys that I just generated. That succeeds. I'm going to take a look at the object file that rests on disk. Again, the file name timestamp has advanced. We have another new version of the object. And the ciphertext has changed because we're using different keys. We're now using the key that I passed in rather than the key that Swift would have allocated from its own key master. And finally, just a final sanity check. If I do a get and again provide my own keys with the get request, then Swift is going to decrypt this object and give me back my plain text. OK, that's the end of uh, our demo. Back to Janie. All right, great, thanks. OK, so why is this hard? Well, it turns out if you take Swift as it is upstream and add a couple middleware to encrypt and decrypt just the object body itself, uh, the API is not maintained. In other words, functional tests would pass, I mean, would fail. Uh, so part of the reason that is is because the E tag or the MD5 hash is not what's expected. So the team has found a solution to that and to several other problems I would love to have time to get into, but they're listed here. If you're interested in talking about them later, we can do that. We started late, so we gotta kinda go through this. Um, we're working on the feature branch upstream, uh, very close to landing. We hope for that to be in the Newton release. Uh, no promises, of course. And uh, we're interested in knowing uh, feedback about use cases and integrating with the other projects. So please let us know if you're interested in talking. And just reiterate, thank you to everyone who worked on this, and thank you for everyone, to everyone who came. And so, hopefully, questions. Hopefully we have some time for, we have a few minutes left for some questions. Yes. Um, great, uh, great work. Nice presentation. Uh, any thoughts on um, integrating the uh, pull model into uh, external key managers like uh, that support uh, KMAP or stuff like that? So IBM's done a little prototyping uh, using that pull model and uh, talking about the KMIP use. Um, and we have someone working in Barbican. There's uh, Fernando Diaz is probably the person you want to talk to to get some more details. Um, for upstream, there's uh, a lot of challenges with, uh, again, maintaining the advanced features. When the uh, Swift cluster doesn't have access to the keys at all times, there's some problems. Actually, the <laughs> talk yesterday on bring your own keys had a great uh, comparison of different models for bring your own keys and the advantages and disadvantages. And we kind of have a similar story here with, yeah, playing with Swift. Okay, so I'll just um, repeat the question briefly, if anyone didn't hear it. The question was, have we given any thought to secure wipe concepts, uh, for example, uh, down to the level of being able to uh, delete the key for an individual object, so it's effectively securely erased? Uh, yes, we've given a lot of thought to that. It, it is one of the more, um, as Jane mentioned, one of the more challenging aspects uh, of, of, of key management. I, mean, I, I mentioned at the start that one of the reasons we wanted to work towards um, supporting more flexible key management was, well, the example I gave was actually securely wiping an entire tenant's uh, content without having to uh, impinge upon other tenants' content. We, we have given it a lot of thought uh, right now. That's kind of future, on the future track. Uh, our key master is a little simpler than that. Um, but but I, I think I'm confident that what we're building you know, allows that fle flexibility, allows us to start to explore those kind of concepts. Another question? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned being able to integrate with something like Barbican um, when working with the key master. Um, have you also thought about working with Castellan as a generic key manager interface? 
Is that what you're using? It, yes, essentially okay. it would be Castellan, but I, I didn't have time to explain. Okay, I was yeah. just checking. Cool, thanks. Okay, one more. I was just curious if this um, introduces any additional overhead from a CPU perspective or how lightweight it is. Yeah, it does. Uh, it doesn't come for free, um, so that's a great question. And we are uh, we're in the process of characterizing uh, the performance um, impact of, of doing the encryption in the proxy. Um, as I'm sure you'll understand, Swift is a pretty complex system, so you, you know benchmarking, performance benchmarking, is something you have to do carefully and present the results in a way that doesn't actually confuse. So I apologize, we haven't quite got that ready for you for this summit. Um, but some interesting early indicators. So one is that actually the encryption algorithm is real quick. Um, and that is not where we see uh, the bulk of our uh, performance impact come from. Um, it's actually that, and we keep mentioning the entity tag, that, that MD5 hash. Uh, so as we transform the data and do the encryption, we have to kind of like calculate new versions of the attack. And so that's actually where we see cycles being lost is in doing that calculation rather than in doing the actual encryption engine. Um, very, very hand-wavy. Uh, it depends on the object size, but the impact that we're seeing is equivalent to, if not a little bit less, than the impact we see if, for example, we choose to use erasure coding, which is also implemented uh, in the proxy. Um, yeah. For the bring your own key, do you store any information about the key that the user provides? So I'm thinking about the use case where I have my own key, I encrypt it, and then when I want to retrieve the object back, I accidentally give you the wrong key. Yeah. Will you just give me garbled text, or will you throw me an error message? No, so, so the, answer, the answer is um, right now we don't, but we know that we need to, um, and it's, it's a patch away. Okay. Um, and, and actually, it'd be great to, to chat about if you've got ideas as the best way to do that. So I think what we realize, we need some kind of uh, identifier, something where we can basically correlate the key that was used when we encrypted and stored the data with the one that's provided. Uh, with the get request and then take the appropriate action if the two don't match. Uh, and my guess is the appropriate thing is not to just simply return garbage. <coughs> so it'd probably be some kind of 400 response. So, yeah. So, right. Okay, I think we probably need to stop. Um, sorry if you had a question. Come and uh, grab us afterwards. And once again, thanks for coming along to the talk. <laughs>